Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to start by thanking Dr. Mike Bennett for inviting me and Henry Schein Facility for um, having this wonderful um, um, place to the conference uh, room uh, today, as well as the sponsors that we mentioned. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about pneumopedics and really focusing on obstructive sleep apnea. I'll try to give you a little bit of background in terms of you know, how this, these concepts developed. If you have any questions, don't feel shy to ask the question. Uh, we'll try to share it with the audience and as time permits, we'll try to fill in other questions as they occur. So you've, you've heard um, the background here. So conflict of interest disclosure, I am with uh, Vi uh, Vivo's Biotechnologies as the president. So that's a company behind <coughs> this. Um, the devices are registered with the FDA and uh, FDA cleared for mild to moderate sleep apnea. And we've also mentioned several of the patents that have been issued. I don't know if you recognize this uh, young man on the left side, on my left side. This is Dr. Giminow. He's from Stanford University. Probably one of the founders of uh, sleep medicine per se. And so it's really good for us to be able to talk to our medical colleagues who are beginning to really understand and appreciate the contribution of dentists to this medical condition. And so this is a multidisciplinary approach. The dentists play a central role, but the MDs are very much with us, as well as the other healthcare professionals in managing some of these patients. So what are we going to do today? Um, we've got a short amount of time. I'm going to talk about the principles of craniofacial epigenetics to a small extent. We'll talk a little bit about epigenetic orthopedics and a little bit about epigenetic orthodontics. So those are kind of new words, and we'll go through those. And then introduce the idea of pneumopedics. So we know that orthodontics is moving teeth. We know that orthopedics is remodeling bone. And what I'm suggesting here is pneumopedics, we're going to remodel the upper airway. It's a new idea, but the strange thing is we've been doing this for about a century, maybe longer, without realizing what we were actually doing. Okay, And then the way we do this, the way we provide the new pediatric therapy is through oral appliances. But these appliances are slightly different because they are biomimetic and we'll look at that idea a bit more as we go on. So there's a slightly different range of devices. So let's look at what Dr. Gimino said here. He said there's an interaction between craniofacial morphology and the upper airway. So we are able to look at a patient's facial features, craniofacial features, and from there decide what kind of airway do you have. Do you have a strong pan open airway? Do you have a restricted airway? If the airway is restricted, what is the site of that restriction? And what is the severity of that, of that restriction? And the people in this room can really target the therapy to find those sites and work with them. So we're going to apply these concepts as a potential cure for obstructive sleep apnea in a multidisciplinary dental setting. So we're looking at mild and moderate cases predominantly, maybe some severe cases, but we're working with this team of professionals. So the MDs, the sleep specialists, the ENTs, the pulmonologists are going to help you to reach a working diagnosis and then in your dental clinic, you're going to provide these devices which are going to try to resolve the underlying condition. That's a tall order. I mean, that's, that's big, okay? So what did I mention at dinner today? It's never been a better time to be a dentist. This is, to me, the golden age of dentistry where suddenly we are reconnected with the medical field, making a tangible difference to human health. And that power, that potential is in your hands. And we're going to take that ball, run with it, and score a few goals. Does anybody have a bulldog? Let's look at a bulldog from the side view. That's what it looks like. So what are we taught in terms of sleep apnea? Most people say, I'm going to wear this CPAP mask. Some people don't like that. Some people don't have very good compliance with the CPAP mask, OK? If you're not going to do a CPAP, the other option is surgery. Surgery is no fun. It's kind of expensive, and there are risks. It is very efficient, but not everyone wants to have the surgical solution. 
So what we say is a third way is let's do a mandibular advancement device. Let's pull the jaw forwards while you sleep and let's use that as a way of therapy. Well, here's a bulldog and why do bulldogs snore? There's only two mammals that have breathing, sleeping, airway <coughs> issues. One of them is bulldogs and the second one is humans. So let's look at this bulldog here. Well, look at that lower jaw. It's already far <coughs> forwards, but these dogs have decreased longevity. They don't live as long as other dogs and yet the mandible is very far forward. So how can mandibular advancement devices alone be a solution for sleep apnea? What this represents is a phenotype, okay? So this phenotype, let's call it a class three phenotype. Let's talk about a class one phenotype. The genes that you inherited are going to produce a phenotype that you see clinically. My question is, can I change this phenotype non-surgically without doing surgery? Can I change it without drugs, injections, without using any painful procedures? That's a big question. So when you see the word non-surgical, think of the word epigenetic. So the genetics say, here's my genome. I will produce you a phenotype. But what I'm saying is, can I work with that genome non-surgically, epigenetically, to change the phenotype? Well, there was this really famous guy, and his name was Darwin. So Darwin was here today, he would be up in flames, okay? So Darwin said that the genes that you inherit will determine the phenotype. Okay, there were some other people working with him around that time. One of the guys was called Wallace, okay? So um, he probably was a predecessor to, to Darwin, but his ideas weren't really accepted by the medical community. Darwin's father was an MD. He was from a famous family, well-known family. So his ideas caught on real quick. There were other people with similar ideas whose uh, work wasn't as well recognized as Darwin's. Here's an example of a surgical procedure. Here's a pretreatment. And this is the same lady post-treatment. And we look at this and think, she looks like a supermodel. She looks very glamorous. Aesthetically, cosmetically, there's been a dramatic improvement. There is no doubt. But the improvement here is structural. This is the famous case. A documentary was made showing how the facial features improved and how the health deteriorated. She developed pain, chronic pain, headaches, couldn't talk, couldn't swallow, couldn't sleep, couldn't breathe. And so, yes, we can do a surgical procedure, but it has to address the functional requirement of that patient. So the question now is, can I change that phenotype non-surgically? Can I change it epigenetically? This is an extreme case. We don't see all our cases, all our patients are not extreme patients. We can make a classification system saying here's a mild case, a moderate case, a comprehensive case, a severe case, or a complex case. So let's say mild, moderate, not so you know, extreme examples. Can we change those phenotypes epigenetically? So um, that's, that's a question, okay? So now let's look at the upper airway Craniofacial size and obesity can alter the upper airway. So what we have in this top row here is the tissues that you find in the craniofacial region. So number one, you've got the normal amount of soft tissue. You've got a normal shape and size of the bony enclosure, that's the jaws, and you have a normal airway. Now what we have here is this patient who is obese, excess amount of soft tissue, the jaws are the normal size, but the tissue pressure is causing the airway to collapse. So if you have an obese patient who's been diagnosed with sleep apnea, we need to address the BMI, we need to address the obesity, we need to address the craniofacial obesity in these patients. Now here's a patient who has a normal amount of soft tissue, but the jaws are smaller than required. And so the tissue pressure here 
is causing airway collapse. Well, we are the people who work with jaws. We know how to manipulate jaws, how to remodel jaws, how to reposition jaws. And so if we can work with this part of the craniofacial system, maybe we can impact the upper airway. But craniofacial is unique. You've got soft tissues, you've got hard tissues, bone, you've got functional spaces, the airway, and what else do you have? Did someone say teeth? Craniofacial region is specified by these unique sets of tissues called teeth. Okay? So what's the big deal? The big deal is that the teeth are attached to the bone. And if you remodel the bone, you have a chance of remodeling the airway. Now, orthodontists and orthodontics have been done for centuries, and successfully so. But think about when you want to build a house. You don't do the interior design on day one. You build a foundation, and then the final thing you do is put in the furniture and the interior design. So let's think, go from general to specific. Let's align the body, let's align the jaws, and then we'll align the teeth. And if you do it in that sequence, you have a good chance of preserving and enhancing the patient's upper airway. So I mentioned this idea of epigenetics, and you can read the paper, it's in Nature here. It's a study of phenotypic changes which occur without changing the DNA sequence. So you're changing the phenotype without changing the genotype. So if Darwin was here today, he would disagree, okay? The changes that are mediated by these chemical groups, proteins, systems, chromatin, which surround the DNA. So the human genome has been sequenced, but around that, surrounding it, is the epigenome. And the epigenome is uh, reactive and able to respond to environmental stimuli. Stimuli such as light, stimuli such as pressure, stimuli such as nutrients, okay, components from the diet. And we can talk about epigenetic modification. These are the biochemical reactions that occurred. You've got ribolization, acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation, sublimation, ubiquination. And the test is to say that after two pints of beer. <laughs> so here is the human epigenome, the structure surrounding the DNA. And what we found here, this is uh, going back uh, 18 months or so, scientists are working on this uh, project. It's a complicated system of switches that regulates genes. So genes are being expressed. They're expressed specifically in certain sites and not in other sites. Genes can be upregulated, they can be switched off, they can be downregulated, they can be modulated. Okay? So it's a complicated switch of genes. And the reason why they're looking at this system is because they want to look at new ways to treat diseases and potentially cure them. So let's take a, ubi a, a ubiquitous disease such as cancer. Each cancer is individual. It has a signature. And if you find that signature, you will knock out that cancer. Just like a vaccine, it will not reoccur. There will be no remission. This is the power of the human genome. It's like talking to the body on a molecular level. It's very precise, it's very targeted. If you find it, it's a huge deal, okay? So we also mentioned the word biomimetics or biomimicry. <coughs> what we're going to do here is mimic nature, okay? So biomimetics is a science. It studies natural models, uses these designs and processes to solve human problems, okay? So what is our natural model? Well, we are symmetrical on the outside of the body, pretty much. And inside the body, there are regions of asymmetry. That is not a coincidence. We are encoded, genetically encoded, to be symmetrical in certain areas and asymmetric <coughs> in other areas. That's the human model. The human model is two eyes, 10 fingers, 32 teeth. That is not a coincidence. So why do we have two eyes? Stereoscopic vision. We can go into the details. Okay, why do we have 10 digits? We can go into the details. Why do we have 32 teeth? 
and why does that molar have five cusps and why do you have a cusp of Carabelli? It's not a coincidence. Human evolution as a science evolved over a long period of time and it was done very, very, very precisely. Enamel thickness is not a coincidence. The amount of enamel thickness here on the molars differs from the enamel thickness on your incisors. You're going to produce enough <coughs> enamel to last you at least one lifetime. And to be on the safe side, I'll give you two lifetimes. So if your enamel is worn away from the incisal edge, you need to be about 200 years old to expose that dentine. That's in evolutionary terms, okay? So look at enamel thickness. So the point I'm saying, the point I'm making here is that we have a natural model that we want to replicate, duplicate, and emulate as much as we can. This is biomimetics where we can take a natural design and try to mimic and copy it. So we're going to have a series of devices is going to mimic natural growth and development, which is encoded by genes, okay? So now let's be a bit more specific. What do you mean by craniofacial epigenetics? And we can say that we're going to use a person's natural genes. We're going to correct and strip the jaws, the teeth, the soft tissues, the functional spaces. We're going to do it painlessly using biomimetic appliances. So these are natural genes. This is not gene therapy per se. This is not GMO, OK? We're not doing any artificial gene uh, transplantation. This is not transgenics. This is the genes that you inherited, the genes that you were born with, the genes that you keep for the rest of your life. The genes are sitting there. They're not doing anything. They're dormant. And the point is, we can talk to the human genome. Dentists, the dental profession, can talk to the human genome. And so what we're going to do is saying, can we correct these tissues, these craniofacial areas, painlessly? We know historically that when you wear braces, you typically get a pain response. And there are many, many papers out there. And what the papers show is that when you're wearing braces, you are using the inflammatory process to cause bone remodeling which then allows you to move teeth, okay? That's one way where you can move teeth. You can move teeth mechanically by applying these forces and by stimulating inflammation. The body doesn't do it that way. So how does the body move teeth? It's through genetic expression. So what we know, studies are showing that premolar teeth erupt in the early evening. Deciduous teeth are exfoliated in the late evening, and the tooth fairy comes at night. <laughs> That's how it works, okay? So if we have a pain-free protocol, we are not inducing inflammation. And what do we know about inflammation? Inflammation is not good for the body. Inflammation causes uh, wear, tear, it causes premature aging, Every system of the body, the free radicals can cause damage. And so we want a pain-free, inflammatory-free process as far as possible. And the way we're going to try to achieve that is by using devices which are biomimetic. So epigenetic orthodontics, we can move teeth, we can get a cosmetic result, but there are additional health care benefits. So here's a patient. We don't want to induce headaches or migraines. We don't have TMJ pr problems. We don't induce snoring or sleep apnea in these patients. And then you can think about epigenetic orthopedics. So we know orthopedics about bone remodeling. The epigenetic component is I'm going to get bone formation, regeneration of brand new bone. This is brand new bone. You're going to increase the bone volume. Is that even possible in adult patients? And once that bone has been formed, I'm going to remodel it to make, to gain benefits from that bone formation. So this is the epigenetic component of orthopedics. And then we talk about pneumopedics. I'm going to non-surgically remodel the upper airway. How is that even possible? Where did the idea come from? Everyone learned in school the idea of pneumatization. We know there are sinuses in the human head. 
The craniofacial region is unique. It's got a series of sinuses. No other part of the body has got bony sinuses. So what are those sinuses doing there? Where every time you make bone, the bone gets heavier. And so physical therapists, chiropractors, osteopaths will tell you if you don't have a good head posture, the head actually is relatively heavier if you don't have a good head posture. And so if you're going to have a large head with big <coughs> bones, why don't we hollow out those bones, replace them with air, and make them light? That is pneumatization. If you take out an upper third molar, perhaps an upper second molar, what happens to the maxillary air sinus? It pneumatizes into that bony region. You've seen that many times. So there is a mechanism for the body to remodel bone, but the sinuses are part of the upper airway. And so that mechanism can go further distally into the retroparietal area, the retroglossal area, into the upper airway region. Now, what makes craniofacial epigenetics, what makes it different from traditional orthodontics? What makes it different from rapid palatal expansion? Is it the same thing, or is it actually different? The difference is that we are looking at the overall health of the craniofacial region, and we're going to do this by treatment protocols that address the underlying etiology of the signs and symptoms. So I'm looking at the overall health of the craniofacial region. I'm talking brain health. I'm talking TMJ health. I'm talking upper airway health. Is it a coincidence that 50% of the kids who are diagnosed with attention deficit also have sleep disordered breathing? Is that just a coincidence? If these kids are sleeping better, you are going to promote brain development, okay? So here's the thing, children, children's brains develop at different ages. So here's a study that they did. They said, well, let's look at how teenagers sleep. And what we know about teenagers is, generally speaking, they go to bed later and they wake up later compared to an average population. So what they did is said, let's start the school for teenagers later and see what happens. What happened? The grades went up. And so by allowing a patient to sleep better, you can help to promote the neurocognitive function of that person. Okay, so craniofacial health, we're not neurosurgeons, we're not neurologists, but there's a very striking parallel. So um, here's looking at the craniofacial region and then the signs and symptoms. Why is this patient snoring? Why does this patient have TMJ problems? Why does this patient have crooked teeth? It's not how I'm going to fix it. The question is, why do you have these signs and symptoms? If I can unravel that, I'll get down to the underlying causes of this condition. And the knock-on effect will be systemic. So there's a difference between orthodontics and craniofacial genetics. And then palatal expansion we don't do partial expansion, and we don't do rapid partial expansion. So who was the first person in history to do rapid partial expansion? It was a guy called Schwartz, Dr. Schwartz. Okay, the Schwartz appliance you may have heard of, of the Schwartz device. So Dr. Schwartz was an Austrian germ a dentist, and he wrote in German. And I'm one of those crazy guys, I said, I need to go back and read what he wrote, and I managed to find an English translation. And what the translation said is, I expanded this patient rapidly. I thought, okay, he means rapid palatal expansion. Next sentence, I expanded this patient rapidly because I'm going on vacation tomorrow. <laughs> Lost in translation, there's no rush. And if you do rapid palatal expansion, what happens is you start getting bone loss. You get dehiscence. You get fenestration. The roots can perforate the cortical plates of bone. Now, why have we been able to do this historically? Because most of the people who had this were children. And children tend to heal. If you get a bone fracture, you tend to heal it. But what this study showed is that, that not all children will heal 
and those are the adults who have gingival recession, they have bone loss, they've got tooth mobility, there's no rush, okay? And you have to think about what is it that we're doing with rapid maxillary expansion? Actually, what we're doing is targeting the craniofacial sutures. So think about the rest of the body. Can you name any other part of the body that has a suture? No, nope. they're just craniofacial. So they must be doing a job in that craniofacial region which is not required elsewhere in the body. What is the job of a suture? Long story short, the job of suture is to make bone. And the way you make bone is to gently stretch the suture. You don't need to rapidly or aggressively. You'll split the suture and you'll break it. If you gently stretch it, there are stretch sensitive genes. Those genes are found in stem cells. Those stem cells are found in sutures. So we've got this system of craniofacial sutures, but you're a dentist and what you were taught is that what you have is a periodontal ligament. So let's go back and look at this ligament and when you look at it in the 21st century, what you find out is not a ligament at all. What actually is, it's a modified suture. And that suture is full of stem cells and if you talk to those stem cells, they will respond by making bone. If you have a healthy patient, if you've got a patient with periodontal disease, gum disease, gingivitis, those stem cells are under pressure, they're under stress, okay? In the healthy condition, you can regenerate bone. So, pneumopedics, what makes it different from mandibular advancement devices? Is it the same? Is it different? Okay. Remember, here's our definition. We're looking at a craniofacial correction, which would include teeth. Okay. Here's a study that was done um, after 15 years. So these patients have been diligently wearing their mandibular advancement devices for 15 years. Over the over the 15 period, a uh, 15 year time period, the AHI increased from 17 to 32. So as long as they're wearing the device, they're fine. But if they take the device away, the condition, the underlying condition has worsened. It's got worse. What is the first rule of medicine? Do no harm. What's the second rule of me medicine? Make no assumptions. What's the third rule of medicine? Be better than placebo. Be better than doing nothing. Okay. So we're looking at this and you're thinking, well, I know in the short term it's beneficial, but as that patient ages, it's detrimental. Is there something else that we can possibly do? Here's a patient that was referred to us and said, I've been wearing a mandibular investment device and I just can't seem to take a bite out of a sandwich anymore. Okay. So what are you going to do with this patient? You could do orthodontics, you could do surgery, you could do cosmetics, whatever you want to do. But if you're going to be biomimetic, this is the same patient with no braces, no surgery, wearing a biomedic device, you can allow, it's not a perfect occlusion, but you've got it very close where you want to be and you have enhanced that patient's upper airway. How do these concepts arise? Do I wake up one morning and think, oh, I need to do pneumopedics? This is about 15 years of research approximately. And um, so I was, uh, as you know, a professor here in the Center for Craniofacial Disorders. And in the center, we used to see children who had specific craniofacial conditions, FLK, funny looking kids. <laughs> so it was all the exotic stuff, the rare stuff you don't see very often, <coughs> Binder syndrome, Treacher Collins syndrome, Apert syndrome, Cruzon syndrome, etc. okay? What these children had predominantly was craniosynostoses. They had sutures which had fused and the mid face was unable to grow. We had no choice but to do distraction osteogenesis. So we started working on these children and we took the mid face and we did distraction. So uh, Lafort osteotomy and then latency and then distraction and then consolidation. 
So a period of about six to 12 weeks, you bring the jaw forwards <coughs> surgically, and then you allow it to heal in that position. Now, this group of children, these were actually teenagers, when they all came back for review, we did a series of seven, when they came, every single teenager walked through the door with a big smile on their face, making eye contact. I thought there's something else going on here. I know they look better, but the self-esteem, the confidence, all of that, where did that come from, okay? So what I did, we had MRIs in those days. So I started looking at the MRIs to find out what actually happened with this group of children, okay? You can see the mid-facial deficiency here. The, the bone is really small. And you can see how it's changed through the distraction procedure. The distraction was done back here, okay? But you see the effect on the front of the face. You see the concavity here and the good profile here. How did that change? And that change is called remodeling. You didn't just bring the jaw forwards. As you change the position of the jaw, the remodeling process kicked in, and you ended up with a more physiological facial profile. So that was part one. Then what I did was take the slices, the mid sagittal slice from these MRIs, pre-treatment, post-treatment. We just used some software here to show you the uh, color coding to show what happened, where it happened, by how much. So you can see the facial profile changed. Here's the red areas. We expected that. We saw the mid-facial bone volume increase. We expected that. But there's a third area right about there. What is that red area? That's the upper airway. And so by doing a mid-facial procedure on these kids with craniosynostoses, you were able to improve the upper airway. So maybe these kids are sleeping better and that's when they wake up and they feel good, and that's where they get the self-confidence uh, self and the esteem. So I thought, most people don't have craniosynostoses, most people have regular sutures, so why don't we take that idea and see if we can redevelop the airway in people who've been diagnosed with sleep apnea. So that's where the idea came from. And then the question is, this was done surgically, can I s achieve the same or a similar result non-surgically? Can I achieve that result epigenetically? So before you do that, let's raise a hypothesis and test it and just see, is it scientifically valid or sound? So I called it the Spatial Matrix Hypothesis, published at the University of Michigan quite a few years ago. So what the idea is, is that during growth, when a child is growing and developing, the spatial and functional alignment of the skeletal elements is maintained through remodeling of bony surfaces. The child is growing, the maxilla is growing, the mandible is growing, the bone starts to remodel, including the periodontium to permit function, the teeth are going to start to erupt through that bone as the bone remodels as the child grows. We all know that, okay? But here's what happens, you get environmentally induced changes. So this child genetically is a class one, but they start thumb sucking. They have a pacifier, they start bottle feeding, and suddenly what happens is you have an environmentally induced change, and that produces changes in the early morphological relationship. In other words, you get phenotypic variation. You just change the phenotype. So genetically, the chi was a class one. The thumb sucking comes in, you increase the overjet, you increase the overbite, and now you've got a class two case. So what happens here is this new solution, this class two, is a departure from the genetically encoded body plan. The body is expecting you to be in a class one relationship, but clinically, you're a class two. And so what the body has to do is try to deal with this new solution. So how does the body do that? You, it undergoes developmental compensation. You have to compensate for the fact that you're supposed to be a class one, but clinically you're a class two. And this compensation permits compromised function. So I can chew, but my teeth are crooked. You know, I can eat, but I get jaw pain. I can breathe, but I'm snoring at night. This is compromised function. And what does compromised function do? Compromises human health. And that compromises longevity and quality of life. 
So what are we going to do? We are going to decompensate. We're going to take it back and then take it forward. So here I'm driving down you know, the freeway in Utah, and the GPS says, turn right, and I just keep going straight. It says, recalculating, do a U-turn, and then come back. That's the compensation that the body does with appropriate spatial signaling. How many dentists have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for medicine? At least one, probably two, at least one. The first guy was John Sherrington, University of Bristol in England. Why did he get the Nobel Peace Prize? He found that teeth have proprioception. You've got mechanoreceptors in your periodontium. Your teeth know where they are in space. Your tongue knows where it is in space. And so typically, I don't bite my tongue when I'm speaking or because we have proprioceptive capability. So, if we are able to change the spatial relations, what happens is we're going to reestablish the pattern formation for optimal form and function. This is a thing called temporospatial patterning. Okay? Now, if you're lying in bed and can't sleep, please read a book on temporospatial patterning. It will knock you out. <laughs> the hypothesis was written, you know, 2004. This paper came out in about um, a year ago, 18 months ago. What is this paper saying? It's saying exactly the same thing. It's saying, mind the gap, Genetic manipulation of basic cranial growth within synchondroses modulates calvarian and facial shape in mice through epigenetic interactions. It's saying exactly the same thing. What it's saying is that the cranial base is growing. There's been a genetic mutation of the cranial base, but the face changes through an epigenetic process. So there was a genetic mutation, and there was an additional epigenetic process which produced a change in the facial shape. This was done in mice. Let's give three clinical examples, okay? Down syndrome. Everyone in this room can recognize a child with Down syndrome. The genes of the face, the genes of the tongue, the genes of the teeth, in these children with Down syndrome are normal. But there is a mutation elsewhere in the craniofacial region, probably in the cranial base, and what it produces, an epigenetic change in the face, which is recognizable. Second example, fetal alcohol syndrome. You might not be familiar with that. Similar idea, genetic mutation of the cranial base, and you have these faces, these recognizable facial features, through an epigenetic process. Let's give a more common example, adenoid faces, long face syndrome. You recognize it clinically every day. The genes of that person are normal genes, but something went on to change the phenotype. That is an epigenetic procedure or protocol. So now we're thinking, how can we change the phenotype in these adult patients Okay, what is the dental phenotype or the dental morphology in patients who have been diagnosed with sleep apnea? So we took uh, 108 patients here. They all had sleep studies done in the university hospital. And you had two groups, the people who have sleep apnea and the people who do not have sleep apnea. And then what we did is we superimposed the first group on the second group and then we color coded it. Okay, now these have been corrected for size. In other words, if you've got a guy who's six foot six and a guy who's five foot six, you correct them for size to begin with and then see are the jaws actually different in these two groups of people. And what did we find? The upper jaw is narrower between 7 to 11% in the people with OSA. The lower jaw is narrower 10 to 11% in the people with OSA. The mid face has undergone concentric collapse. In 3D, the mid-face has, has actually collapsed. So if the palate collapses, like a high volt palate, a narrow palate, what do you think is happening in the patient's nose? 
The floor of the nose is the roof of the mouth. It's the same bone. So if you've got a narrow palate, the chances are you're going to have nasal obstruction. If you've got nasal obstruction, you're probably going to have mouth breathing. Or at night time, you're going to probably have some form of sleep disordered breathing. Here's an adult patient, came to the dental office. We know there's an orthodontic history here. We know the premolars were extracted. We know from this patient that when she was a teenager, those teeth were nice and straight. And now she comes back and she's 45 years old. What is the chief complaint? I'm not concerned about my teeth, but I've just been diagnosed with sleep apnea. What are we going to do? I want the functional space. I want to get the space back where those premolars used to be. That's the functional space that this system needs to be able to work efficiently. And you can take another patient here, premolars missing. You can start to recapture the premolar spaces. Now, there's a space that you see, and what is underlying that space is bone. Okay? There's going to be bone here, and <coughs> bone here, and here, and here, which allows you maybe to place an implant when the treatment has been finished, or some kind of restorative finish. So let's look at a study. Here's an adult patient diagnosed with sleep apnea, and he's going to have about a year's worth of active treatment. The transpalatal bone width increased from 34 to about 39 millimeters. So we're not tipping the teeth here. The teeth are going for a ride with the bone. The bone's getting wider. The suture is doing the work, OK? And you see spaces between the teeth here. Because this patient said, I don't want to have implants at the end. It's an expensive procedure. And so we allowed the spacing just to be distributed in that anterior segment. Now, look at his airway. This is pre-treatment, and this is post-treatment. There's no device in this patient's mouth. The airway increased 70% in volume after about a year's worth of treatment. And here's the airway pre-treatment, and here it is post-treatment. There's no device in the patient's mouth. Here it is pre-treatment, and there it is post-treatment. That airway got bigger. It's the 3D cone beam. We can measure volumetrically what happened with the upper airway. It got bigger. What happened to the patient's sleep apnea? We had a sleep study done before treatment, and now we'll do it 18 months later. His AHI went from 24 down to 3. I took about a year with no device in the patient's mouth. So AHI is an apnea hypopnea index. Apnea is when you stop breathing. Hypopnea is when you start getting um, desaturation, okay, and flow limitation. So that is moderate sleep apnea. Now this is less than five. So if the age is less than five, it's within normal limits. You do not have a diagnosis of sleep apnea. And cosmetically, this patient has been finished with veneers, so it looks okay. And you can see that its facial profile, you know, hasn't changed that much. He doesn't have a protruded mandible. He's happy where he is. So um, this paper that came out um, is talking about, can you actually change an upper airway? It says, public, the available published studies show evidence of can be measured anatomic airway changes with surgery and dental appliance treatment for OSA. Which dental appliance are they referring to? The case that I just showed you. The paper was written in 2013. There's only one study in the literature at that point showing that you can actually change the airway and demonstrate that on a comb beam. And as you're doing this, you start getting some cosmetic effects. So this young lady here, you can see that she starts getting some facial changes. And you see the upper arch is changing a little bit. You see the lower arch here has changed. The position of the tongue has changed. And when you superimpose, the gray is pre-treatment, the blue is post-treatment. Most of the changes happened on the right side of the face. Why is that? We are encoded to be symmetric. And so with the appropriate signal link, you can restore symmetry. And you can see that the, the right side of a face is probably undeveloped or underdeveloped compared to the left side of a face. 
and maybe that's why this is uh, this is why you get these localized changes. Her upper airway increased from 17 to 28 cc's. That's a dramatic increase in the airway. So when the air is flowing, it's Poiseuille's equation. The resistance to airflow is proportional, inversely proportional to the radius of the fourth power. Do you have a physicist here? No physicists. Okay, I'm fine. Okay. So, um, in other words, if you have a millimeter increase in the airway diameter or radius, that will be a tremendous amount of air going into that into that pipe. Okay. So this is the pneumopedic effect. You can remodel an airway. And then what happens is the upper jaw is being remodeled. <coughs> the teeth are not tilting. Okay. Is the bone actually getting wider or are the teeth just being moved out of the way? So we measure it. On average, it went from 33 to 35 and a half. And so it got wider. Okay. But did the bone volume actually increase? We have the technology to do that. And one of the guys involved in this study was Derek uh, Preble, who's here with us today. And so what we see is that the bone volume absolutely increases. Okay? This is in one case, went from 14 to 15 cc's. What the study showed is on average went from 17 to 19 cc's. That's about one dice that you throw when you go to Vegas. Statistically significant. And we actually got a small prize for showing that you can actually grow the bone volume of the mid-face in adults without surgery or drugs using a biomimetic device. So this patient here, you see he's a class 3 phenotype and he's not happy with appearance and he's 24 years old. And he's been told that the only thing we can do for you is surgery because, quote, you have stopped growing. And he's not keen on surgery. So he started looking at the internet and comes across this device. And we say that we can take that mid-facial bone volume and we can increase it. And he's interested. And so here he is pre-treatment. And this is the same guy two years later. No surgery. OK. Is it ideal? No. Is it an improvement? Yes. Is it a happy, healthy patient? Yes. Maybe a best patient. Let's take another one. Same doctor, OK? And so what we see here, you see the mid-facial mid deficiency in this patient. And here he is after about 18 months, two years, you see the mid-facial profile has changed. So you're able to increase the mid-facial bone volume in these patients. So if you have a class 3 patient who's been diagnosed with sleep apnea, where are you going to put the mandible? It's already protruded. Okay, and so let's find a biomimetic solution for people, all people, children, adults, any type of uh, patient that might come across. So look at the bone volume, the, the width here is increased from 31 to about 35. And look at the airway, uh, it's improved a little bit. It went from 2 to 4, from 5 to 8. So minor changes, but remember a millimeter in the mouth is a huge amount of distance. And so what does this look like clinically? So look clinically, it's the same patient here. Here she is pre-treatment. And we see this kind of gummy smile. And here she is after 18 months. OK, no braces, no surgery. This is genetic potential. This is residing in the human genome to saying, I can heal you if you give me the conditions to do so. OK? Different patient, different dentist. I'll show you a cross-section to show you it's the protocol and not the individual. They are very highly skilled dentists, we know that. But if they follow the protocol faithfully, most cases, most of the time, you'll get a beneficial result. So different uh, doctor here, and you can see that the airway is not bad to begin with, but look at the amount of changes that you see here. But what I want to show you, if you look very carefully, here's the upper arch. And here's the lower arch pre-treatment. And you can see where the lower arch went post-treatment. The mandible came forward on its own accord. Now, not all patients show that response. But sometimes what happens is the mandible is being trapped by the maxilla. Redevelop the mid-face, you allow the mandible to come forwards. Okay? 
not all mandibles are created equally. You need to do a craniofacial analysis to find out what kind of mandible am I working with. Some of those mandibles will take off and some won't. Okay? This is a good example. Different doctor, same result. Here the patient is pre-treatment, because of the air volume uh, here, airway volume, and the cross-sectional area. There is no device in this patient's mouth and the airway volume and cross-sectional area have increased over about 18 months of treatment. You can actually take the 3D airway and we can now print the model, give you a biomodel and show you what these airways look like. You can show it to your patient as an educational tool saying, would you want to breathe out of this little straw or out of this big tube? Which one do you prefer? So, summary, pneumopedics is non-surgical operatory modeling, results of treatment from a biomedic oral device. We're using principle of epigenetics, using these naturally occurring genes, we're correcting deficiencies in the craniofacial region, and the tissues are slowly remodeled and redeveloped over a period of time, making these corrections to the upper airway. It's non uh, surgical is pain free, no drugs, medication or rejections are involved. So here's the structural changes, the functional space of the upper, air, upper airway increases volumetrically. You can actually measure the airway volume and it's going to help with the basic physiological functions such as the breathing during sleep. This is about airway, it's about breathing, it's about sleep. Okay? And for this reason, this system of biomedical devices can be used to treat reduce and potentially eliminate sleep apnea. That's a pretty powerful statement. That here's a modern disease that we think we can knock it out in most cases, most of the time. Okay, so we need a very thorough, comprehensive diagnosis. We need excellent patient compliance. And we need some clinical adjustments, which will be done by the dentist and the dental team. How does that work? How can you eliminate sleep apnea? Okay, well, is there an increase in the nasal cavity width? Is there an increase in the nasal airway? Does the nasal airway volume actually get bigger in these patients? Well, we can measure it. Here's a patient who had treatment for about a year. You can see the distance between the nasal septum and the inferior conchae, 1.7, 1.2 at the beginning and it's increased to about 2.5 to 3 after about one year of treatment. So when my ENT colleagues see this device or this result, they're saying, which surgical procedure did you use? I'm saying there's no surgery involved. They get very excited. The ENT people have cases where they are, quote, spinning their wheels. These are non-responsive patients. There needs to, be a, needs to be a structural intervention which is non-surgical. And so the, the aim of this study is to look at the nasal airway to see if we can change it, okay? Um, 11 patients, uh, average age 38, about 18 months of treatment. And the 3D reconstruction was done by this famous guy called Derek Preble who's here with us today. We can take the nasal airway here Reconstruction 3D, okay? And you can see, here's the sinuses on both sides, here's the nasal cavity. We're gonna measure the volume and do a statistical test. And here's one of the patients who actually took part in this study. You can look at the nasal airway from the outside. This is a great photograph to take for your patients. Just lie in the chair, take the shot going through the chin towards the forehead. And what you'll see is the nares, the opening of the nasal airway pre-treatment and here he is after about 18 months. That air is going into that nose, convert him into a nasal breather. Why is it so important to be a nasal breather? Your sinuses are producing nitric oxide. When you breathe through your nose, you pick up the nitric oxide. Nitric oxide as you know is a small vessel dilator. It goes all the way down to your pulmonary alveoli and you get very good oxygen exchange. Nitric oxide is the molecule of the century. Look it up. It does a huge amount of benefit to the human body. So what happened in these cases, on average, the nasal volume increased from 39.8 to about 42. There's about two cc's of air 
we've got a small prize for showing this work. This young lady was part of that study sample. And what's your diagnosis here? Well, I'm seeing narrow nares. I'm seeing malocclusion. And that double chain, that's sleep apnea. And here's the same lady after 18 months. No braces, no surgery, no drugs, no injections and no pain. Happier, healthier patients. Well, if you can increase the nasal airway, what effect would that have on sleep apnea? Okay. So let's look at these patients who have been diagnosed with sleep apnea. So 11 patients, 21 or over, treated by a dentist with advanced training in dental sleep medicine. Okay. On average, it went from 13 down to about 4, statistically significant, 68% reduction in AHI. Some of these people are less than 5, with no device in their mouth. This means a sleep amnia has been resolved. They no longer have sleep amnia. And here's the paper that's been published. Okay. And what do we have here? 19 patients, um, different dentist, similar result, okay? So we do mild, this is mild cases, moderate cases, and now what we have here is this 27-year-old female. She came to the office with TMD symptoms. Dr. Ben is smiling, okay? So she came to the office saying TMJ problems. When you do a screening, we said, well, you may have a high risk of sleep apnea, let's do a sleep study. And she agreed to a sleep study. It came back with AHI of 105. That is off the charts. We said, oh, this is a severe case. You need to see the sleep specialist. Referred her to the ENT, to the University Hospital. They did a sleep study and said, yeah, AHI is above 100, 118. Referred to the ENT for so tonsillectomy, okay. And the AHI went down from 118 down to 70. And the NT and sleep specialist said, you need to be on a CPAP for the rest of your life. She's 27 years old. OK. She said, I'm not happy with the CPAP thing. I need to find something else. Starts researching the internet and finds out this thing, which is called a DNA appliance. And so we said, if you're going to wear this device, you have to wear it in combination with a CPAP because you have such severe sleep apnea, which she did, okay? She wore the device for about a year, and then we tested her again, and what we found is AHI was reduced to about one with no device in the patient's mouth. So for a period of about, you know, let's say two years, she went from 100 down to about one. If the AHI is less than five, you no longer have sleep apnea. So, the sleep specialist, you can see her airway, or you can't see her airway before treatment. Here she's after tonsillectomy, so structurally it's opened up from here, but the rest of the airway was deficient. Okay? And so when we did the, uh, the device for about a year, sent her back to the pulmonologist, another sleep study, and what they said is the nasal airflow was of good quality, no significant disturbance. And the impression is no sleep apnea with or without the dental appliance. The sleep specialist said, you no longer have sleep apnea. You have been uh, resolved. Yes? So Dr. Singh, do you believe that she needed to have the tonsillectomy based on what you said? Or if she would, I mean, if she would have worn a DNA appliance, would the tonsils have also shrunk in your opinion? In this case, 50-50. If you take a younger patient, like a child, would the tonsils regress if you did not do surgery? In a younger patient, the answer is probably yes. In an older patient, let's not take any risks, especially if it's a severe case. Did anyone see the typo on this report? The typo says, with or without the dental appliance, okay? This is not a dental appliance. What is this? This is the medical device. It's a class two, FDA cleared medical device for mild to moderate sleep apnea. So medical colleagues are great people to work with, but when they see dentist and something going in the mouth, they call it dental. That's a medical device in your hands. It's a medical condition that you are gonna be able to address, 
Okay. Yes. I'm somewhat Clients haven't used any of them. Mm. But in the case of a severe apnea patient, concern is this, this appliance is going to take some time to do its job. We've got to keep them alive and breathing until that can function and work. So, mm -hmm. do you typically recommend this in conjunction with CPAP until they can wean off of it? Sure. Is there, or do you do something different? I don't know. Sure. So, the question is if you have a patient with severe sleep apnea, you know, the device might take 18 months, what do you do? I guess the, the other part of that question is anytime we shove something in somebody's mouth, we're, we're going to probably make the airway even more restricted. For so, a while. two questions now. Yeah. <laughs> the second question is if I put a device in a patient's mouth, I'm going to restrict the airway even more. So, let's take the first question. So, you have a patient with severe sleep apnea, what are you going to do? You're going to recommend CPAP, you know, ASAP. Okay? Now, the patient may say, I can't comply with CPAP, I don't use CPAP or anything. So what you're going to do is then is saying, I'm going to use the device in conjunction with the CPAP. And typically what happens is the CPAP pressure comes down a bit, and then they're wearing CPAP maybe three nights a week, and then eventually they're just wearing the device, <coughs> and eventually you wean them off the device. So the idea is if it's a severe case, there are guidelines saying, when would it be appropriate for a dentist to treat severe sleep apnea? And there are some pretty good guidelines for that. The second question was, when I put a device in the patient's mouth, it's going to restrict the airway even more. Well, this is where you do the craniofacial analysis. Without an analysis, it's a guess. And you might have a very good guess based on your experience, but we don't take any guesses. We're going to measure at least 100 craniofacial parameters. We're going to look at the site and the severity of the obstruction. We're going to customize the device to meet those targets. So people talk about, quote, the DNA appliance, but guess what? It doesn't exist. What you have is a family of devices. What you have is the principles which you will customize for every single patient to make sure that you meet that patient's requirements. If the device is, quote, bulky, the bite registration is way out. The volume of the device, when it goes into the patient's mouth, will be um, small compared to the net gain of volume. Think of Archimedes' principle. You step into the bathtub, the water gets displaced. So the volume uh, of the device going in is less than the volume, the net volume you gained. If you don't do that, then you are saying, I've made the patient's airway worse, and it can happen with an inferior bite registration. Luckily, we have some great experts at bite registration. One of them is called Dr. Mike Bennett. So bite registration is critically important for success. And the patient will tell you immediately, I can wear this device because it's beneficial, or it feels, quote, usually they say it feels bulky. If they say it feels bulky, you have been roached on that patient's functional space. You need to adjust your device, okay? And so we can do that. We've done, I would say, I don't know, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 cases. We would know by now if, the ca if it wasn't beneficial. So um, we talked about the pulmonologist here, and this study was written up, and it was actually published as a paper. And then we repeated the study with different dentists using a larger sample and on average a 64% reduction in um, severe sleep apnea. Okay? So we can see here this guy went from 56 down to 18, this guy went from 40 down to 3, 41 down to 4. Some of these cases did pretty well with no device in the patient's mouth. And if the HI is less than five, it means that they no longer have sleep apnea. It's an also a published study. So let's look at some more studies. These are kind of short term, these kind of longer term, slightly longer term. This is looking at the results. A patient has been off the device, okay, for six months now. And you can see the yellow parameters. All of these guys have increased in a beneficial way. So the parietal distance here, retroparietal has increased, 
Okay, the width of the airway has increased. Retroglossal has increased. You know, the, na the nasal um, surface area has increased. You can see the nasal changes inside the nose here and the, air and the volume of the upper airway. This is after five years, different patient. This is after six months. This is a different patient after five years. Upper airway volume about five. This patient is 60 years old. And now he's 65, and look at that for an airway. That's an anti-aging device. I don't need orthodontics. Do I, do I wear my own device when I sleep? I don't have sleep apnea. Yes, I do. Well, why would I wear a device? It's an anti-aging device. Just like going to the gym, you work out, you go for a jog, you keep fit. Upper airway mostly has muscles around it. It has a bony architecture, okay? You want to look after that airway. It goes all the way down to your pulmonary alveoli. So this patient, after five and a half years, the airway volume increased, almost like doubled, tripled. The uh, cross-sectional area of the air, uh, airway, look at that, from 67 to 477. That's a huge amount of air flow going into this patient's lungs. Inside the nose, increased from one to about two and a half, okay? Um, on the left side also increased, the behind the nose, the air we increased, the bone width went from 37 to 41. So the actual width of the maxilla didn't change that much. But look at the impact on the upper airway. A millimeter inside the, inside, the, inside the mouth is a lot of space. And uh, the retropartal airway here increased from four, four and a half millimeters to 29 millimeters. Um, I've talked about adults. You can also do children. Pediatrics, okay? This young teenager here, you see pre-treatment, look how much mouth opening she's got. That TMJ has been resolved. She's got a deep overbite, a little bit of remodeling on the upper arch, and deep overbite, the mandible comes downwards and forwards. So you can harness the growth potential of these patients if you get them early enough and in, in my opinion the sooner the better and what do you mean by that I'm talking about epigenetics which means the preceding generation so when grandma okay is pregnant her daughter has her granddaughter's eggs that's epigenetics you are forward planning See the kind of uh, retruded facial appearance here? You can allow that just to grow and redevelop. So children respond a little bit faster. They all got that genetic process going on. The growth and development is going on. So you can get some very good uh, results in some of these pediatric cases. Deep overbite, it's been improved. No braces were used. You allow those teeth to come into occlusion. And whilst you're doing that, you're going to improve the nasal airway, the breathing function. This is the adult cosmetic case. Okay, she's 39 years old, and she's been told she's a surgical case. Went to like three or four really well-known orthodontists, said, you're a surgical case. And the question is not how are you going to fix this, but why does she have anterior open bite? Why does she have this big gummy smile? And the patient's body will tell you what I'm doing. So we look at her face, and typically we do a craniofacial analysis of the face. And what do we see here? If you look very carefully, the left nares is obstructed. She can't breathe through the left side of her nose. Now what we have is a nasal cycle. She so breathes through the right side of your nose, and then you switch to the left, and that cycle lasts for about 60, 90 minutes. Some people have it really well developed, some people not so much, okay? So let's say she's breathing through her nose on the right side, and everything is fine. But it's time to switch to the left side, what she do? She opens her mouth, becomes a mouth breather. That's where the gummy smile's coming from, okay? Now imagine she's sleeping at night time, lying on her back. She's breathing through the right side of her nose, and she's fine. And now it's trying to breathe the left side of her nose, but she opens her mouth, but the tongue's fallen back. You wait 10 seconds, and you had your first event of apnea. 
So what we're going to do, what we need to do here is we need to fix that nasal breathing. The floor of the nose is the roof of the mouth. And here she is, mid-treatment. And do I see improved nasal symmetry here? And we look at her at 18 months. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. So 18 months of treatment and no braces, no surgeries, and a happier, healthier patient. This patient here, if she had been diagnosed with sleep apnea, where are you going to put the mandible? 18 months, and that mid-face has been redeveloped. Now, the interesting thing is this is Dr. Kwan Gyon Kim from South Korea. He's a great guy, doesn't speak a word of English. So what did he do to get this case? He followed the protocol. He just followed the protocol, said, this is what I'm supposed to do. And he followed the protocol and said, hey, patient, here's what you have to do. And with excellent compliance, you will get great results. Three parts, comprehensive diagnosis, excellent patient compliance, and then some good clinical adjustments, which can be done by yourself or the dental team. See this patient here? See the mandible is retruded. Mandible is going to come forwards. We're going to convert her from being a mouse breather to being a nasal breather. Did we pick the best patients? Let's do the study. Is there any facial enhancement in adult patients? Yes, there is. The two big findings was the labiomental angle improves and the thyromandibular angle improves. The labial mental angle, the angle between your lip and your chin. And this has a small angle, deep overbite, mandible is retruded. As the angle gets bigger, the mandible comes down and forwards. Okay? The thyromandibular angle, the angle between your chin and your neck, if it's a big angle, high risk of sleep apnea. As the angle gets smaller, you decrease the risk of sleep apnea. What happened to the angle? It got smaller. So by having better facial features, you actually have more um, systemic health, OK? And we've been through the summary already. OK, we've done all this. And so here's the conclusion. So the conclusion is that non-surgical operatory remodeling can be attained in children and adults. It suggests that a genetically encoded developmental mechanism may be epigenetically modulated by biomedic oral devices to enhance your airway in patients with sleep apnea. And so these findings will help doctors, dentists, orthodontists manage patients with sleep apnea, including children, using a pneumopedic and a craniofacial epigenetic approach. I would like to thank you for your attention this evening. Thank you. for questions. I think at least one question, okay. yes. So is the, the condition of the, of the um, narrow and high volume of uh, or, or palate of the jaw um, more prevalent in developed countries than it is in third world countries? But I've often wondered about the relationship of bottle feeding, pacifiers versus nursing. So um, I'm very PC. There's no third world anymore. It's developing nations, OK? But it, you're absolutely correct. If you go to a modernized, industrialized society, you could go to a place like Japan, let's say, or a place like, you know, Norway. Sorry, Dr. Singh, would you repeat the question? So the, the question was, um, do you find with the prevalence of high volt pallets, narrow pallets, are they restricted to certain countries, or are they right across the board? And so the answer is you find it predominantly or more commonly in industrialized countries, OK? Probably due to the lack of breastfeeding, probably due to pacifier use, probably due to bottle feeding, and the so-called SAD diet, the standard American diet. It's an inflammatory diet, OK? And what that diet does, it starts to congest your nasal passages, and if you're not nasal breathing, you're mouth breathing. If you're mouth breathing, the tongue is going to go down, and the palate, instead of being broad, will become high arched. 
And as the arch becomes more narrow and high voltage, the nasal septum is more likely to deviate and cause nasal obstruction. So prevention is better than cure. And so what we want to do is promote breastfeeding for lots of different reasons. Hard diet, okay, which involves a lot of chewing, and the refined processed foods, it's a big no-no, okay? It's a big no-no because they are causing a lot of, you know, inf inflammation and, and health issues. You won't see them in children at the beginning maybe, but as a child gets older and older, you start seeing some chronic diseases start to develop. The sad thing is, the children that are being born today are less healthy than one generation ago. For the first time in the US history, longevity has gone down for the first time. Not by a large amount, but a small amount. And so that is an, uh, an epidemic that we can reverse. You're very welcome. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I was really curious. I just took a second and I looked on, online what your device looks like. Can you explain what, what's the difference between that and the towel expander? And, uh, tell me about that. Right. So number one, it's not one device, okay? So there's no point me showing you one device because you'll think it, it's not like a, it's a system or a family of devices. And what these devices do, they do two things. They do spatial signaling and they do cyclic intermittent signaling. So what we were taught is palatal expansion, okay? And palatal expansion, what you do is you split the suture, now it's midland diastema, the bone eventually heals, and then often you can move the teeth into place. So, you know, that's not, how the, that's not how the body grows. The body doesn't grow by fracturing a bone and then healing it. We can do that, it's a backup. But the way these devices work is by gently stretching that suture. And when you stretch a suture, the suture contains stem cells, and some of those stem cells have stretch sensitive genes. They're going to respond to that change in the spatial signal. And they respond by making bone, and the bone then gets remodeled. So there's a huge difference conceptually and clinically in terms of how you deliver the protocol. So how much pressure is being placed on that suture? Yes, and we don't need pressure at all. So Mike is my good friend. So Mike, I'm going to shake your hand. How much pressure was there there? Not a lot. Not a lot of pressure, but boy, he got a big strong signal thinking, this guy's got a strong sh handshake, right? <laughs> so the point is that it's about communication. So there's a door, and you want to get past that door, and the door's locked. So what are you going to do? You've got two choices. You can kick the door down, you'll get through, but a better way would be to think, and someone will open the door for you, and that's how the body works. You give a signal, it's a subtle signal. The body is extremely good at picking the signals. Every single cell knows where it is in space. Every single cell in the human body, and I'll show you the studies. You take two cells, one will respond this way, one responds this way, based on spatial signaling and the nature of the signal that it received. That is a big topic called temporospatial patterning, which you and I can discuss at dinner. Excellent, excellent. It it's not like braces at all. No, it's not. So it's uh, about design, it's about materials, it's about protocol. So this young lady is actually wearing a device. And so what is different about the device? Number one is the design. So that every single component on that device is doing a job. We know what job it's doing. If it's not doing anything, I don't want it to be part of this device. So that's design. Number two is materials. The great thing is that there's been a lot of research on materials. So we have materials with specific properties, and we can use those properties to give a type of signal. It might be a spatial signal, it might be a cyclic intermittent signal. We can use materials to do that for us, okay? Part three is protocol. So all of us here are subject to the circadian rhythm. 
Circadian rhythm, for example, we start getting melatonin release, we start feeling sleepy. You get into stage three sleep, you start producing growth hormone, okay? And so there's no point wearing a device during the daytime when most of the growth hormone is gonna be released at nighttime when you sleep. Let's wear the device at nighttime. So DNA stands for daytime, nighttime appliance. You don't wear it during the day. During the day, you do myofunctional therapy, you do breathing exercises, you do body alignment. You wear it in the late afternoon, early evening and all night to capture the circadian rhythm because the hormones will do the work for you. Yes. So, is this just for the mid-facial patients or are you uh, trying to do it for So the question is, is this for mid-facial only or is it more than that? So what are the criteria when you screen? When you screen. Okay, so question number one is, is it mid-facial? Question two is criteria for screening. So question number one, is it mid-facial? The answer is no. What is our target? Our target is the upper airway. The upper airway goes from nasal apertures up to the cranial base, all the way down to the hypopharynx. Okay? So that's our target, is the upper airway. So it's not mid-facial. The device looks as if it fits to the mid-face. That's where it goes inside you. But the target is remote from that. And then the criteria, you're gonna do screening for these patients, and we actually actually go through a diagnostic process. So we'll take facial photographs, We'll do a 3D uh, cone beam scan, we'll do a sleep study, we'll have the study models, and we'll be able to work out what, what is the site and the severity of the obstruction. Yes? So for the children, are they like the braces that you would want them to get, be, have all of their permanent teeth in before you started, or are primary dentition still okay? Sure, so the question is about pediatric cases. When would you start it? Do you need to have primary teeth, permanent teeth, mixed dentition? So, um, I would say less than six. So maybe by age of three, four, five, six. The earlier you go in, the more chance you have at early resolution. The longer you leave it, the harder it gets. A class two malocclusion will not resolve automatically, it won't do it, okay? So let's prevent the class two from occurring in the first place. So less than six is uh, probably ideal way to go, but we can take children, we can take teenagers, we can take young adults, the, the full range. You know, the youngest child that I know was treated about age of about three, and the oldest patient that I know was treated at age of about, I would say maybe 73. So what's the criteria? If you've got a pulse, we can probably do something with you. <laughs> can I add to that? Yes. So I, I want to just add a couple of thoughts to the pediatric side. Um, the first DNA appliance, if you will, is mom or and the tongue of the child. And so we want to look at them, really, even before they're born, we want to talk to the parents. If they're planning on nursing, they need to be able to have a good latch, good nursing experience, because it's mom and the proper suckling technique that the child's face and upper airway will grow. And so sometimes there's a lip tie and a tongue tie, posterior or anterior, and we can get that process started and correct the growth problem early. And they won't even need any of this. They don't have apnea later on if they get the proper cranial facial growth. Does that help as far as, and so we do have devices. If we don't catch it at that stage, we do have other devices that are kind of the rubbery type uh, devices, mild functional appliances that we can get into the child and help that growth to occur. Very good. Question? Yes. Dr. Bennett, do you do work with these devices or how do we get our patients into these devices? Yeah, I, I am a certified provider. I've gone to all the Dr. Singh's courses. And uh, if you'd like me to consult with the patient, send them over. And if you're planning on doing it, I'd be happy to visit with you about your cases. Great, thank you. Yeah. Just curious, with, uh, does insurance cover the, this device? It's a, so if you're treating a medical condition like obstructive sleep apnea, then you go through the pre-authorization process. 
10, and if they say, yeah, go ahead, then they will cover it. Um, otherwise, it's a, it's a crap shoot. Okay. But if we refer to you, do you guys do the pre-authorization? Yes, we do. Sweet. Yeah. Lori, raise your hand. Where's, mm -hmm. where's Lori and Kelly? Mm -hmm. back here. If you have lots of medical insurance billing questions, she's your girl. She'll, she'll answer all those. Yeah. Give, give them the uh, website to go to just for more information. Okay. Yeah, um, vivoslife.com. Yeah, vivoslife.com, D-O-V. There are brochures inside of your folders for adult managers and the email folders. Hmm. Yeah. It's all in the binder. <laughs> <laughs> what does the certification process consist of? At right now, it's a, a nine-day curriculum. So do three-day pediatrics, three-day craniofacial, and three-day pneumopedics. And so really, they are reinforcing as you go along. Probably next year, 2018, it'll become four um, three-day events, like a mini-residency. But what we're actually doing with this is making it to a one-year full-time fellowship in dental sleep medicine for dentists. So what actually happens is uh, you go through the fellowship program with the sleep specialists and at the end of that program you do the board exams, for example the American uh, Sleep and Breathing Academy and we're hoping to have a new specialty of dental sleep medicine as a recognized profession. Uh, right now we just do these weekend training events um, but we want to really grow that. Just a comment about that. If, if you do sleep medicine, sleep dental sleep medicine, put anything in the mouth, you are changing craniofacial structures. So knowing, uh, having an understanding of the joint disorders, both internally and mm -hmm. externally, neurologists associated with it, any conditions that can mimic facial pain, jaw pain, you want to know about that because you can flare somebody up and they're going to be mad at you. And so you want that basic background Sleep is easy if you've got the craniofacial pain background, at least so that you can screen out. You don't want the headaches. I did this part time in the general dental office for years and uh, felt like after learning this type <laughs> of stuff, I thought I, I've got to go full time with this because I can't focus deep enough or go deep enough with it with the knowledge base that you need. And so I sold my practice about eight years ago and I've been doing it ever since full time. So anyway, get that education along with the certification. You talked initially about the patient with, some, with migraine headaches or so forth. But is there a relationship that you're seeing uh, with this treatment and the power expansion and, and the upper airway increase with change in, in migraine symptoms? Yeah, certainly. Um, Mike, you know, well, we've, we've certainly published we, a classic case, a young lady, and she'd been uh, diagnosed with migraine for about 11 years and constantly, you know, been to neurologist and tried everything. Um, so we had a look at her and um, what we found was obstruction in the nose and we, you know, we treated her and followed her for two years, migraine free. Um, so. What happens with some of these patients, and Dr. Bennett's got much more experience with this, is that patients who get fragmented sleep, who don't get good quality sleep, when they wake up in the morning, they're not refreshed, they're actually fatigued. And that fatigue will play out during the day. And so one of the things is that if you're fatigued, your pain threshold is low, and things like backache, shoulder ache, neck ache, TMJ, headaches become to the fore. Okay, That's part of it. Now, sometimes the patient will have a history of chronic pain. Um, it may be typically, or kind of, you can get an example of a young, non obese female, okay, with things like uh, digestive problems, okay, and, and may have cold hands and cold feet. That would be going more towards UARS, Upper Airway Resistance Syndrome. If you take severe UARS, now you're talking, you know, my, my fibromyalgia and or chronic fatigue syndrome. So there's a kind of gradation, there's a kind of spectrum. But pain, uh, as Dr. Benny will tell you, is, you know, needs to look in context in terms of this is how they're presenting. 
but there may be some underlying pathology which hasn't been really looked at or been addressed. Would you agree, Mike? Yeah, I, I would, and I'd add to that that trigeminal nerve is the largest of all the sensory cranial nerves, right? So if you've got injured structures talking to the brain, like injured joints, um, inflammation in the paranasal sinuses, nasal pharyngeal space, any of the branches of the trigeminal system will cause an increased amount of fragmented sleep. We call it microarousals or alpha intrusions. So alpha intrusion, it's like you're breathing great, but somebody's poking you all night long <coughs> and your brain activity is wakeful. And so you never have the repairability that you need to heal injured body structures. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, strains from postural imbalances and so forth. So it is connected. So that was back to the original question. Are chronic headaches, migraines associated with sleep breathing disorders? And the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, you've got to treat both if you want long-term success. Okay. I guess, I guess we're good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.